I think we're live. I think we're live. And it is about uh, one minute after five. So I am one minute late. But that's okay, because today we are going to talk about an important topic, uh, marina safety. So thanks for joining us and joining me and all, everybody out there. And uh, Bill, Shell, and Miss uh, Jeff, thanks for joining us. Okay, looks like uh, we got uh, Virginia and we got upstate New York. Thanks for joining us. Article 555 in the National Electrical Code, NEC 2023. So I got to change that slide. Look at that. NEC 2023, and this is how we get that done. You ready? Watch this. This is what we call live. Bam. Okay, so if for those of you who have been a, uh, a, a part of one of my programs, this is a 15-minute tech talk. I have never hit 15 minutes. I think I hit 15 minutes once on my very first one because I was being due diligent and I was trying to be a good boy. Well, good boys, it's not me. I need to cover the material. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start that clock over there, 15 minutes, and I'm going to just, uh, my goal is to try to help people understand some of the public inputs that are coming in around marinas. Uh, some of the areas that I think uh, you might find of interest and concerns and whatnot. So uh, let's dig into it. Let's put that time on the clock and let's get going. So marinas, uh, you know, is that an issue? Is it an issue? Why are we talking about marinas? And if you've been to any one of my programs on marinas, I'm passionate about it. Um, Lucas, Lucas Ritz was my inspiration. Uh, and Jeff, uh, or I'm sorry, Joe uh, Fellow. Uh, gentleman that worked for me, he's now retired. He and I, uh, he approached me about uh, Lucas's story and said, Tom, you get into codes and standards work. How do we fix uh, the issues? And there are unfortunately a lot of statistics around, um, uh, around the deaths of children in and around marinas. Uh, two boys, that, now, I mean, if you don't know Lucas's story, um, Lucas Ritz, if you just Google his name, it's a very well-documented case. There are a lot of videos. There's interviews of, uh, of Kevin Ritz, his father. I just re recently reached out to Kevin. Um, I am going to, uh, I, I've got some ideas on how to increase safety in marinas that I think he can help out with. Um, so, but in any case, um, you should Google Kevin, or I'm sorry, Lucas Ritz. You can Google Kevin Ritz too, his father. Uh, he's very passionate about uh, safety in and around marinas, does a lot of teaching and whatnot. But uh, Lucas, uh, Kevin and, and uh, Cheryl uh, lost their son to a, an event in a marina. And their story is something that I think is worth uh, your your time. Uh, other examples, Cherokee Lake Marina, ben, uh, uh, Bean Station, Noah Winstead, which uh, eventually became the, the Winstead Act. Um, in in uh, in that state uh, we had uh, nate linham you had the nate linham act uh, in west virginia here we had the cunningham act uh, michael nutson passed away so there are if you just google marinas and electric shock drowning you will find the examples of every summer uh, you know, people who die in and around marinas and it's just it's just terrible and codes and standards is trying you know the national electrical code nfpa 303 is trying to um, and 307 is trying to do things but i think um at some point you know we have to look at the requirements that we've currently have in the national electrical code and you really have to question what more can you do and when do we have to focus on existing marinas which the national electrical code I mean, it doesn't talk about maintenance in the National Electrical Code. You can't talk about uh, 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 recurring in, in inspections in the National Electrical Code. It's an installation requirement. So there's only so much we can do in the National Electrical Code. And then you look at the changes that we have, and we're going to talk about uh, some of the proposed changes. But when you look at what we've done around ground fault protection of equipment and GFCI protection in a marina, you sort of want to wonder, do we... Do we pause and say, how, how do we know what we've done so far is making a difference or will make a difference? And maybe that's the difference that we need. So we just had a, uh, uh, I'm on another task group with regard to NFPA. We have a small group of individuals who are 
um, just trying to come up with for the, for the research foundation, what does, what do we need from the research foundation in this area to help in the 2023 code process? And that was a point of discussion with regard to existing installations. Is it the national electrical code that we have to consider and worry about, or is it some other effort to address existing marinas uh, across the country? Now let's look at 555. Uh, the dot, dot one is our scope, and, and this tells us it covers, there was some recent expansion of 555 over the last couple cycles. Um, you've got, this now covers one and two family dwelling units, uh, multifamily dwelling units before they stripped that out. And it became at one, it wasn't the 17 code, I think maybe it was the 17 code. Uh, it might even been the 14 code, I'm not sure. Uh, one of those added the fam family and dwelling units and multifamily dwelling units back into 555, expanding its application. Uh, we, in the 2017 code, I believe it was, merged floating buildings into 555, got rid of that article. And in this last cycle for the 2020 code, looking into the 2023 code, I chaired a task group with the help of, of uh, Dean Hunter and... Um, and uh, Cliff Norton and a bunch of others who are very well versed in marinas and the design and the implementation. Uh, I'm, I'm a facilitator, so I just try to help make things happen. Um, so I'm just looking at the chats here. Hey, can't follow live. That's okay, Gustavo. This is going to be up there, buddy. Check it out. If you have any questions, let me know about it. Thanks for joining, uh, Jeff. And thanks for joining Nihad, Mr. Sharif, uh, El Sharif. You and I have to talk about uh, our GFPE program too, buddy, and a few other things. So. so we had a great task group associated with 555. We were looking at other bodies of water and marinas and looking at the relationship there. And I, I think as we go down through, and I'm going to show you some images that uh, Donnie Cook, Donnie Cook, Chief Electrical Inspector in Shelby County, Alabama, brought up with regard to where's the where's the tie or where's the split between swimming pools too, because uh, I I know you've seen them as I have. You have a, a docking facility and then you have a, a a swimming pool ramp right next to it. Is that a swimming pool? Is it a marina? Is it a uh, um, you know what what is it? How do you treat it? How do you inspect it? So in any case, um, you know these are all great questions that the code tries to answer, but in reality it's probably far beyond the code on how to address some of these issues. Okay, so um, uh, a couple key informational notes that are included with the scope. Now, this is all part of the existing code, uh, just providing us guidance to look at 303 and other, and 307 for construction and fire protection of marine terminals, uh, piers and, whatever, and wharves, and also 303 is the standard for marinas and boat yards. These are some of the images, you know, I've been on a lot of inspections uh, since I took on this, um, this journey of trying to increase safety in marinas and in, in my heart and memory of Lucas Ritz. Uh, there is, uh, you know, you've got situations like this where you have conductors in the water and, and, and might I add that these conductors uh, get chafed and get rubbed, right? So, so those become shock hazards. Again, there's, you know, these these, you know, you have you have these little buoys and stuff like that to try to keep boats away. But, you know, inevitably, we have have found those conductors being rubbed completely clean. You know, then you have the MacGyver. I call this the MacGyver effect. I mean, it's part of all of us. I mean, we all just, you know, we are um, we make do we we make things happen. Um, we we will bend the rules uh, with regard to uh, the, you know, installations. So we've, you know, over my time of experience of, of looking at existing marinas, this is the type of installation that you see. Now, NEC 2023, I could categorize the changes in these areas. Uh, definitions, uh, location of service, load calculations, boat hoists. We're going to go through each of these. Um, so just sit back. I'm going to, I, I've, I've, uh, I've got the public inputs. We're going to bring these up on the screen. I want to look at them with you. I'm not going to say whether or not I like them. I don't like them. That's, you know, I don't sit on panel seven. I, I have my opinion. Just ask me. Uh, but, but I just want to share with you what people are thinking with regard to the national electrical code. And I'd love your, your, uh, your input and whatnot. So, um, in any case, uh, I say we get started and uh, let's take a look at some public inputs. 
All right, so I know I have the Adobe file here, and we're gonna start with definitions. Okay, so definition, the first thing, uh, there was a task group, David Williams, uh, you might know David Williams, he's an electrical inspector in Michigan, I think Lansing, I'm, I'm not sure, I can't remember, I'm, I'm, for some reason Lansing is in the back of my head, uh, but um, uh, David chaired a committee that modified the style manual. One of the decisions that has been made for the National Electrical Code to 2023 and moving forward, all definitions will be located in Article 100. Now, what, what does that mean? That means that some people love that idea, and that means some people hate that idea. Uh, just like in any, any change in the National Electrical Code, you will have people on both sides of the fence. You can't please 100% of the people 100% of the time. So uh, what this does do for those who are for this move, they like the concept of going to one place for a definition. You know, we have the web, their, their comments are, when you want to know the definition of a term, what do we do? We grab the Webster def Dictionary and we look up the definition. I don't go to 300,000 different books to figure out the definition of a word in the English language. I go to the Webster Dictionary. Now, there might be different dictionaries, obviously, you know, but, um, and I got my dictionary. If you ever want to know about, uh, you know, I, I make up words all the time. Uh, so, but in any case, uh, there are those that say, I like one place one location. Now, there are those who who aren't in favor of that that say, I like the fact, for example, someone may say, look, uh, birth, you don't use the term anywhere else other than a marina. So if I'm a marina person, I want all of my terms in Article 555. It's nice, it's compact, it's all real close to each other, it's easy to find my definitions. But the last, over the last two cycles, there's been a lot of controversy over that definition, does it apply to other articles if it is used? And if it doesn't apply to other articles, you need to specifically say that. So we went back and forth on, uh, on how to deal with those definitions. So these definitions are all going to be located back up into Article 100. There is David Williams, Delta Charter Township. Uh, he's out of Michigan. And uh, so you're, you'll see a bunch of public inputs throughout the National Electrical Code to move all the definitions back to Article 100. Now, what will probably happen, where a definition only applies, to, say, to marinas, it will be located in Article 100, all in alphabetical order, but it will sit, it'll state a couple things in the parens after uh, the words, uh, after the definition. It'll tell you that it's a Code Making Panel 7 responsibility. They still own that definition. And then it'll tell you if it only applies to Article 555. So there are some terms that only apply to that article and uh, the changes uh, in the style manual will provide you that information to let you know if that definition only applies to Article 555 or whatever article. Uh, floating building, again, delete the definition from 555 and move it to Article 100, that was Roger Zig. And if you look at his substantiation, um, the definitions shall apply only within this article, see? Uh, this statement does not apply to the term floating building. The floating building is used in Article 555, but it's also used in 9090.2a. So this was part of the problem that you're having with definitions. You'll say, oh, this is only a part of, of that. And look, it's two minutes. I'm going to blow that 15 minutes out of the water. 1521, uh, this is interesting. Electric datum plane. This is a new definition now. Electric datum plane in marinas is either the ground in areas away from the natural or man-made bodies of water or one in land areas subject to tidal fluctuation, uh, highest tide level for the area uh, occurring under normal circumstances, that's the highest tide, uh, in land areas not subject to tidal fluctuations, the electric datum plane is the highest water level for the area uh, occurring under normal circumstances, um, uh, subject to tidal movements and areas in which water, blah, blah, blah. If you look at his uh, substantiation, no standard exists for where an electric datum plane is located. And, and, he, and, and who is this? Um, whoop. Who is this? Wade Elliott, uh, Utility Services. Wade has a very good point. Um, he has a, 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 I'm sorry about that. Hold on. There it is. Nope, that didn't do it. 
Wade has a good point because, um, see this, this is all part of being live. Uh, Wade has a good point because it, it, as I talk to people across the country and, and when I was working with inspectors and we were looking at things, I asked, how do you determine that datum plane? And, and how do you know what's the, the, the highest tide level, all these great things? And they, they have their references, they have their websites, but there was really uh, no definition for that. So Wade's trying to put that in and you'll notice he has another companion uh, public input in 1522. Uh, and that says the normal highest water level, this definition shall only apply within this article. Normal highest water level is defined as an elevation delineating the highest water level that has been maintained for a sufficient period of time to leave evidence upon the landscape. This is interesting. Commonly, the point where the natural vegetation changes from predominantly aquatic to predominantly terrestrial. Ooh, terrestrial. Wow. But that's a good point. So I've heard other people say this. And in fact, I was on an inspection and we did look where is where are those lines and you can see that but not in all locations i've been to some arenas where i could not find that um so this is this is a um this is a a, a, a an interesting predicament on how to determine the highest water level how do you know what the datum plane is all right and that's the definitions so look at that that was easy so we got a new definition for datum plane and highest water level Hopefully, we'll see what happens on those. But uh, hey, if you like those definitions, put it down in the put it down in the chat. You know, give us your feedback on 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 a couple of those. I also put the link to download uh, the public inputs. I believe I was only LinkedIn. I have to put it down below as well. Uh, but in any case, um, check check that one out. It it um, uh, check those definitions out. Let me know what you think about them. All right, so now we're in five. We went straight from 555.2 to 555.33. This is dock lighting underwater luminaires. Now, underwater luminaires is what drove GFCIs way back in the day in the early 70s in swimming pools. So let's take a look at what this got. Uh, and, and, you know, I'll tell you, I'll be very honest with you. I have not read through all of these. So I'm learning this as you are. Um, uh, a luminaire design, normal operation, the design of an underwater luminaire. So, so I just couldn't help. Bill Shell, Bill Shell, problem with that definition is that the moon drives the tides. That plane will be different uh, for Maine and Florida. It needs more clarity. I would agree with you, Bill. I agree with you. And you know what Mark Early says? I look forward to your public input or public comment at this point, because here's the nice thing. It's on the table. There's not a new material concept uh, with that topic. All right, take a look at this one. Now, you got to be careful in looking at some of these public inputs because although everything is underlined, it may or may not actually be new text. So what you're going to want to do as you read through public inputs is to get your 2020 version of the code book. Now, another important thing to remember, this 2020 code book does not, um, does not have uh, um, any of the TIAs or anything like that, obviously, because it's a hard copy. And even if you're looking at the free version online, it doesn't have that. Uh, Al's on, and, and uh, hold on, let me take a look. Let me see who this is from. Al, the man. So Al says this was taken from swimming pools in Article 680. So this is a new um, a new section, and and he's telling us, and this is Al Teresi's um, uh, public input. So thanks for joining us, Al. I, I was kidding him. Uh, I mean, Al's got a lot of public inputs in there, and he's got some really good ones. Um, uh, and some, I'm, you know, you know, I'm just going to have to vote against. But uh, just kidding, Al. Uh, but he's got some really good public inputs in there, and. Um, I would say, I told him to text me if he wants to talk. Um, and I got to make sure I don't have it on silent. And it was on silent. Um, but in any case, uh, he says this is taken out of 680. And I'm not going to try to find it. But deck uh, lighting. And, 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 you know, this is talking about luminaire design. Design an underwater luminaire supplied from a branch circuit either directly or by a transformer. Requirement of the section shall be the, such that their luminaires are properly installed without ground fault. There is no shock hazard. 
transformers and power supplies. And then they do put lights in, in these waters, especially in these, I, you know, around these homes. And it, I, I don't know, sometimes it's hard to tell if it was an accident that the light bulb just fell in the water and it was on or they designed it that way. But I don't know. Transformers and uh, power supplies. Secondary is ground and metal between the primary and secondary. Uh, we got GFCI protection for lamping, relamping, and servicing. GFCI for personnel shall be installed on the brand circuit supplying luminaires operating at voltages greater than uh, the low voltage contact limit. And I think that's 50 volts, right? A luminaire facing upwards shall comply with one or two. Have the lens guarded. Be listed without, without a guard. Um, dependence on submersion. Luminaires that depend on submersion for safe operations shall be inherently protected against the hazards. Compliance, compliance, compliance. Compliance with these uh, shall be obtained for the use of listed underwater. So listed uh, for the application helps you. Uh-oh, we got pictures. I love pictures. Pictures are worth a thousand words. So this is uh, L's uh, substantiation. Last code cycle, this was dismissed because of the assumption 30 milliamp protection was sufficient. However, freeze current can occur at 15 milliamps. Uh, I guess what you're talking about is uh, uh, the let go threshold, right? I, well, maybe not. I don't know. 15. Yeah, about 15, 20 milliamps. This level of protection is needed to protect persons from electric shock drownings. I would agree with you, L. I'm... Uh, but I'm not on that panel, buddy. Look at this. And we have listed products for the application. And look, they've got um, um, they've got things in there. I don't know, Al, is that you demonstrating this? So these are solutions that exist that are listed for the application. And I think what you're pointing out, Al, oh, yeah, there we go. Good. Good photo. Man, is that your uh, backyard, Al? Man, that's a that's a nice uh, that, but that's what they do, and uh, that has to be uh, those luminaires are underneath the water. They've got to be listed and labeled for that. Uh, yeah, it helps you see the fish, but one problem and boom. Uh, and he also added a uh, definition of submerged into Article One Hundred. If we got time, I'm going to go back to that one too. Um, hold on, let me. Uh, let me see if I can find that one submerged. So this is what we do. This is this is how I roll. Uh, we we are we are not afraid of uh, of of taking a little journey through uh, the code. So we're going to go to the 2023. We're going to all public inputs, and we're going to open panel one. So what you do is you go to uh, go to NFPA. You can download the whole docket for panel number one. And L says, uh, definition for submerged, control F, submerged. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Let's search on your name, T-O-R-R-I-S-I. Requirements in this code. Permissive. Building. Uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. Submersion. There we go. Location submersion. Uh, a location where equipment is installed, immersed in water or other liquids. There's no guidance on this type of location. Um, mm, uh, let's do this. So I, 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 I'm, I'm just having a little bit of heartburn. Um, L. So here's another thing that we do. Um, a location where equipment is installed immersed. What is the def Webster immersed? Because you know what's going to happen. People are going to say, what do you mean by immersed? Uh, standing out of uh, or rising above a surface. <laughs> a cat with glasses. Hmm. Equipment is installed immersed in water or other liquids. Standing up or immersed. Adjective, standing out of or rising above a surface as of a fluid. Immersed aquatic weeds. All right. So you'd have to fall back on Webster on some of these definitions. But, hey, I love the, I love it. I love it. 
it's looking uh, you know that's that's what you got to do you got to you got to push the issues you got to drive the issues and um you know what uh, 33 we went straight to 33 i missed four six nine that's okay we're going to go to 33 um other than short power where 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 were we is this where we were? Yeah, this is where we were. Let's go back up a little bit. Did I? I miss some stuff. Uh, we got Mike Holt. Um, receptacles for other than shore power shall have GFCI protection in accordance with 210.8. So, well, this is an interesting one. So, chapters one through four apply generally. I know what he's getting at. So here's the problem in 555.33, you know, yes, uh, one through four apply generally. Um, but you got to remember that once you start having requirements about GFCIs, now you are amending what is in 210.8. So what he's saying is receptacles. I said, we said in, in other locations shall be protected He's saying receptacles for other than shore power. That is a little bit more, that does add a little bit of clarity. Makes it clear that the rule is for is for other than shore power receptacles. And we did have a discussion similar to this in our task group work. Uh, so this was a part of the task group work. So here, here, here are the members of the task group. Uh, we had Kevin Arnold, the man, the legend, Tom Blewett, uh, Donnie Cook, Shelby County, Alabama. Thomas Dimitrich, I don't know that guy. I heard he's a real, pfft, he's a screwball. Uh, Bill Fisk, great guy. Dean Hunter. Dean, I'll tell you what. Dean is a, is a rock star. He and I don't see eye to eye on a lot of things, or some things. We see eye to eye on a lot of things, but Dean's a rock star. Love that guy. And Cliff Norton, great guys. Absol absolutely. And who would not love Christine Porter? Uh, Mike Query, great guy. And look at this guy, David Smith. I'm going to tell you, he is an up-and-coming rock star. If I was if I was talking about somebody sitting on the bench ready to get in the game, that guy is going to uh, is going to shake the industry up. So you got to keep an eye on David Smith. We call him David A. Uh, and then you got Dave Watson, Code Making Panel 6. So the other nice thing about this task group was we had Code Making Panel 10, 14, 7, 17, 6, and 5. And then we had David Smith. So, I mean, uh, so in this one here, we said other than shore power, we said receptacles other than those supplying shore power. So similar to what Mike Holt was saying to boats. And we just added clarity, shore power, it goes to boats. We didn't really need to add to boats because that's what the definition of shore power is. Shall be permitted to be enclosed in marina power outlets with the receptacles that provide shore power to boats, provided the receptacles are marked to clearly indicate that the receptacles are not to be used to supply power to boats. So, I mean, it's poetry, especially, I mean, look, look, look at the names on that one. Come on. So trying to add clarity in that 555.33. We just talked about this one. I don't know how I just skipped right up to that one, but I did. Uh, so we talked about this. So this came out of, uh, to L's pro point, um, uh, we took that out of uh, out of uh, uh, what do you call it um, 680. So any he, and he provided some pictures and uh, you know he even squatted down to take a picture of that one and look there's him when he was a kid there's Al when he was a kid getting ready to dive in that lit water. All right, so that was uh, I think I had already scrolled down to there because I was talking to Al looking for his public input. That's how I got to there first. So those are the ones on, 30 uh, on 33, but what we're going to do is we're going to go back now because I skipped 555.4. I do that sometimes. I don't know. I think I'm sick or something. So here we go, 555.4, location of service equipment. We, we, you know, 555 made it clear that service equipment for floating buildings, docks, or marinas shall be located on land. Now, what we did not address is is how far from land or from the water all that good stuff so we added not closer and I, I this was a task group again task group work not closer than five foot horizontally from and adjacent to the structure served but not on or in the structure itself or any other floating structure that's existing language 
Service equipment shall be elevated at a minimum 12 inches above the electrical datum plane. So we're getting it on land, away from the water, and up. So, or, or even the structure that's, that's, that's out there and not in that structure. So, uh, we, and we said aligns with the language in 682.11. So remember what our task group did um, is we tried to correlate 555, which is marinas, boat yards. You know, if there's a boat there, you're in 555. If there's no boat there and it's a body of water where you are, you are in the man-made bodies of water, which is 682. And Dean Hunter pointed this out at the IAEI Western section meeting. And I know everybody out there attended the Western section meeting online this year, but Dean Hunter pointed out that there are conflicts between 555 and 682. He even went so far as to say, look, 555 and 682 should be governed by the same code making panel because they're not right now. And you'll get two different eyes, two different groups of eyes doing two different groups of things. And we wanted to drive alignment. That was the stimulus for our work on our, on our uh, task group work. So this was a change in trying to add clarity and consistency between those two articles. And if you don't like this, then you sure as heck aren't going to like what's in 682 because now they're pretty much the same. And that was the changes in 555.4. All right, so only one change in 555.4. Now we're going to go to 555.6. Just checking my texts, see if L is getting... Uh, Fidgety and saying, I want to say something. Okay, 555.6. And if, and if, and if anybody wants to say something uh, and dial in on this topic, I'm more than happy. Just send me an email to um, uh, uh, tdimitrovich at gmail.com. Oh, I haven't been watching. tdimitrovich at gmail.com. Uh, send me your phone number. If you want to go live, I'll call you. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the chats because I haven't uh, been. Uh, David Smith is out there. Look at that. I'm talking about the guy and he's right there. Got to run. Uh, thanks for the education. He's He was in and out. So boom, he's gone. Uh, probably should be immersed. Yep. Vince uh, Delacroche. Thanks for joining, buddy. Um, and then Bill Shell again, uh, that datum plane ID different along the East Coast. Yeah, you're right. You're right, Bill. It's going to be different based upon uh, where we're at. So that's a very good point. All right. Okay. Um, let's get back to uh, let's get back to work. Five fifty five dot six now. Okay. So we got into this, and let's look at the change. This is again the task group work. When a circuit feeding a boat hoist and shore power for the same boat slip is shared, only the load with the larger kilowatt demand shall be required to be counted in the load calculation. And here was the logic. I have, if I have a boat uh, and I have a, a, say I'm using the, the plug. So this, this was the, uh, the, the issue that was pointed out. And uh, at first I, I wasn't buying it, but then the more I, uh, the more I learned, the more I thought it made sense. If you are plugging into say a pedestal to power the boat lift and you are also using that same receptacle to power the boat that if you're doing the load calculation, you don't have to consider both loads because if you're lifting that boat out of the water, you're probably not powering it up, which makes sense. I mean, if I'm, if I'm taking that boat out of the water, what am I, what am I powering the boat for? I'm cleaning it. I'm running air conditioning or whatever it is. I don't own a boat that's big enough. I don't own a boat. So, uh, whatever they do with a boat by plugging it in, it's probably not happening while I'm hoisting it up out of the water for storage. So it, it made sense. Um, and it says boat hoists and shore power are rarely, if ever, used at the same time. Only the larger of the two loads should be considered in the load calculations. I Originally, I didn't like it, but I fell in love with it after we talked about it and I was educated. Um, let's take a look at another one, 555.6. This is load calculations. When a circuit feeding a boat lift and shore power for the same boat slip is shared, only the load. Okay, so who put this in? Rudolf Garza, IAEI. So uh, um, Rudy is the uh, is the new head of uh, IAEI now, and this is a part of their public inputs. So I'm not sure. Maybe this was Donnie Cook. I don't know. I don't know who put this one in. Uh, but again, at you have multiple public inputs saying the same thing. That's a good thing. 
Here's another one. Look at this. Want a feeder? So we got three public inputs saying the same thing. Who put this one in? William, William Pancake. I like it. Cap Government, Acra Electric, Cape Floral, Florida, Cape Cl Cl Cape Cl Florida. So, um, and he has another public input in 555.6 and 3913. What's this one? 3910. We'll take a look at 3913 too. Uh, but he's saying the same thing. So, uh, the, so what's nice is the task group work. They'll lump all those together. Uh, boat hoist, demand factors for boat hoist. Oh, demand factors. You know what? We talked about this. And this is William. So we talked about this, but I don't believe we did it. Uh, but it looks like he did. Demand factors for boat hoist service and feeder conductors are set forth in table. So he's saying his number of boats, one to two, demand factor 100%, three to five, 80%. So he's saying feeders for multiple boat lifts should be derated due to the fact that boat lifts by their nature are a short duration load and rarely do multiple boat lifts operating concurrently at both condo and commercial marinas. And NEC cranes and hoists has demand factors, but we feel that this article refers more to commercial and industrial cranes and hoists, not boat lifts. And the table, in our opinion, is not aggressive enough to provide practical sizing of feeders for boat lift, lift feeders. Article 430.26 gives the AHJ authority to grant permission for lower demand factors. And in fact, we have worked with local HJs, which have allowed demand factors as low as 30%. But we feel that having a table in the NEC specifically addressing this issue would clarify and enhance the code. So there's his 30% for 25 plus. That's a pretty large marina. I don't know about this one. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Uh, lower demand factor? No lower demand factor? What do you think? Good, bad, ugly? Thumbs up? Thumb, don't 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 hit the thumbs down on my uh, channel, okay? Because of this, same my public input. Uh, you can always hit the thumbs up on the uh, on the content, please, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel because I'll be putting more stuff out. Uh, but in any case, uh, they want to put a demand factors in, so this is going to receive some debate. Looks like he did his homework, and that's the last public input for um, five fifty five dot six. So let's do another one. I'm going to close this window. See, this is how we roll. 555.6 is out of the way. Let's go to the next one. 555.9, uh, boat hoist. Look at this. All right, what do we got? Um, send me your phone number. Okay, go live. Question is, the word derated used anywhere in the text code? Is the word derated? Well, I'll tell you what we do with that bill. Derated in the code. I can bring up. I will do this. Let's do this. I hate when it goes. Um, I'm going to bring up. Um, what was that guy's name? F uh, Fireman, whatever. Let me show you something. So I am going to bring up NFPA. 70 and we're going to bring up the 2017 version of the code right we're going to answer bill's question about the word derated control f i don't know why he's asking the question but maybe he can elaborate in the chat box but here's what we do bill we do a control f d-e-r-a-t-e-d -E -E derated final derated ampacity i figured that was going to be in there derated ampacity that one time that's the only place the word derated is used in the 17 version of the National Electrical Code. So the maximum. So this is just for your reference. Um, part two, 338.10 uses permitted in branch circuits or feeders. Final derated ampacity does not exceed that. So I am sure that is probably a, that term was just not deleted. Now, I haven't checked the 2020 code, so you'd have to search the 2020 code. That's based on the 17. So let's go back to dot nine. We have 73 pages. Yes, 73 pages. There's a, 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 a desire to delete boat hoist, and this is, oh, Thomas Dimitrovich and his band of friends. This language requirement was moved to 555.35 as part of another public input, 1484, as it is more appropriate to locate this requirement as part two, marinas, boatyards, and docking. That's right. 
So 555.9, you got to think about this. In 555, 555.9 is at the front part one, which is general requirements. But the moment you say boat hoist, is that in anything other than a marina? The moment you add a boat, you've got yourself a marina. So we moved that 555.9 to, we didn't change it, we just moved it. Um, and here was another one from John McDevitt, Devitt, McDevitt. Boat lifts. GF side protection for personnel shall be provided for outlets not exceeding 240 volts that supply a boat lift installed. In ah, does not reflect the accepted name for widely used industry term boat lift. Now, so they want, um, uh, they, so there's, he's saying boat hoists doesn't reflect, they call them boat lifts, not boat hoists. Uh, so I, here's, what, here's where you got to be careful. If, if it's listed as a boat hoist, if that's what UL calls it, if that's what the standards call it, regardless if it's UL or ETL or whatever, then it's a boat hoist. You could call it whatever you want. You can call it a Van Ducky. You can say the entire industry calls this a Van Ducky. It's really a boat hoist. So anyway, uh, so he gave some substantiation there. All right, um, 555.9 listed. GFCI protection for personnel shall be provided for outlets not exceeding 240 volts. Okay, so this is a listing requirement. Russ LeBlanc from LeBlanc uh, Consulting Services. I think he writes for ECNM. Um, uh, boat, hoist, uh, in, boat hoist installed at all docking facilities. They removed dwelling units. Interesting, boat lifts and hoist, whether installed at a residential facility or a commercial marina, both pose the same potential shock hazard. Good point, Rudy. Wow. That is, it, it, that's a good input. That's a good input. It's, if it a duck, it's a duck. <laughs> I love it. You're right, Bill. Okay, 555.9, boat hoist. Um, GFCI protection for personnel shall be provided for outlets not exceeding 240 volts. That supply of boat hoist installed at all docking facilities. So same as what Rudy was saying. Um, look at this. Boat hoist associated with fire department, law enforcement, or other government agencies shall be requiring GFCI protection. It also shall install an emergency bypass for such a vessel. Oh, we had this discussion. Um, okay, this is William. Bill, so we had this discussion on our task group as well. We didn't end up going with this. I don't think we supported this one from a task group perspective. Doesn't mean the code panel wouldn't. Uh, they were looking for a bypass for this law enforcement and other agencies uh, because, and their reason was when they got to get that boat in the water or if they got to get the boat out of the water, I can't remember. I mean, if you got to get it in the water, yeah, you probably still need power to lower it. You just don't hit a button and have it go splash down, although that'd be cool. Um, <laughs> that's what they ought to do, right? And then film it and, and actually be in it when they do that. That's what they ought to do. Get in the boat, hit the button, and then when you hit, and you got to have like, you got to think about uh, Bruce Willis and all those guys. You know, that that's that, that'd, be, that'd be a cool movie edition. I'm going to patent that one. But um, they wanted that bypass switch for safety for, you know, it's, it's an emergency situation, but I, I, you know, it, it could be a very valid, uh, very valid. They, they have a reference thing about, uh, 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 shock Marina shock hazard. They reference that go to NFPA for more information, substantially for the hazards and see their research. The exception would allow for emergency vessels to have the same protection as well as a fail safe system in place. Okay. So this is saying you should have that require shall be required to have gfci but they want to bypass uh be a key for equivalent safety operations so i, I don't know and then they uh, that's why it's so long that's why it's 73 pages they put this research uh foundation document in there uh, so you can go through this if you want um more than uh i'm just going to uh bypass a lot of this uh, because this is a report that you can download from nfpa at any 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 time that you want to it's free uh totally completely free uh research so let's go to the next one 
559 GFCI protection for personnel shall be provided for outlets not exceeding 240 volts. Uh, the supply of boat hoist installed at all docking facilities. Again, Bill, Bill uh, Pancake, he, he, he was busy boy. Uh, and he also, again, he referenced that document. And you know what the next few uh, pages are going to be? The same report. Yeah, this can really make things frustrating. I'm going to don't get dizzy. You might not want to view the screen. You might want to just look away. I'll tell you when to look. Uh, and you can look just about right now, and we're at the end. So that's the last public input. Most of those 73 pages were two copies of the NFPA research report. So uh, in any case, uh, that is all for boat hoist. Now let's go to 14, equivalent planes. Uh, an equivalent plane shall be installed where required in this section to mitigate step and touch voltages at electric equipment. So this is a controversial item. You understand what a, an equipotential plane is. You you want to create everything at the same potential so that I you know you eliminate step potential, touch potential, uh, for shock. You don't want that voltage uh, uh, presence uh, differential. So uh, what there what this is looking for, and I believe the public input is from this crazy cat Tom Dimitrovich, uh, but I think it's going to be um, an interesting one. But again, look look at the substantiation. It correlates 682.33 with the same title. The applications are similar, and so they are the electrical hazards. The, the public will assure, ensure the same level of safety is provided in both of those applications. So we didn't create new language necessarily. We moved over existing language, and we may have tweaked it a little bit. But we didn't change the original intent, nor any of the um, uh, measurements and whatnot. Uh, but I think it does present a challenge for a marina um, to create that equipotential plane uh, adjacent to all outdoor service equipment or disconnecting means to control equipment in or on uh, where the uh, following conditions exist, where the system voltage exceeds 250, uh, where the equipment is located, um, uh, three, 10 foot from the, of the body of water, the equipment plane. So you can read it. Um, it, it um, it's, it, we, are, we were a correlating group, task group. So we correlated and we said, look, you've got it in other bodies of water. What's the difference between a marina and this? You need an equipotential plane. So we'll see how this one does. Uh, but if you didn't like this, you sure as heck shouldn't like what's in 682. And you'll notice there's another public input on 682. So what we did was I think we reorganized this a little bit. So 682, let's just double check. Let's take a look at 682. I know you have your code book. Um, because you're as uh, geek as I am about code. So let's take a look at 682. Uh, equipotential planes. And we're not talking about things flying. Electrical datum plane distances 682.5. I think that we made a 682.33. Um Equipotential planes and bonding of equipment. An equipotential plane shall be installed where required in this section to mitigate blah, blah, blah. So let's take a look. An equipotential plane shall be installed, blah, blah, blah. Same thing. Um, we got bonding. Areas requiring equipotential planes. Oh, yeah. Areas requiring equipotential planes. It's the same title. Plane shall be adjacent to all outdoor services. So we had to do some tweaks because uh, we were dealing with marinas and whatnot. But uh, we did have to make some tweaks. But uh, there's the 36 inches. Uh, I saw a 10 foot of the body of water. And areas not requiring bonding. Um, 10 foot is in here somewhere. I can't remember where it's at. But in any case, I'm not seeing the 10 foot. I'm, uh, but up, but up, but up. There's the 36. There's 36. Um, see if I justified that. No, I did not. So it's got to be in here somewhere. I just can't see my glass. My, I don't have readers. I don't need readers, but I just don't can't see when I'm trying to read. So that means I don't need them. There's 36 inches. There's three inches. Jeez, oh man. Um. Yeah, I'm not seeing the 10-foot number, but I just could be blind. But in any case, where a potential plane is located within 10 foot of the body of water, the potential plane shall include all metallic enclosures. We got that 10-foot from somewhere, and I just, for the life of me, I can't remember. I, but I should have put it in the in the substantiation. It might be in 
1554. <clears throat> and that's all the changes on that. So it was one public input. So let's take a look at another one. I'm going to close this window. Let's go to, oh, this is a good one. This will this will make you think. I don't even know how many people we got out there watching. Um, but uh, for those of you who are still with me, um, I am I'm over my 15 minutes. Forget about that. Uh, but this has uh, significant potential. Uh, thanks, Al, for joining us, buddy. Uh, this one here is uh, from Donnie Cook, and he provided a lot of pictures. And we're going to take a look at some other pictures. Um, I believe we are. Yes, we are. He is saying replacement, any modification, replacement or repair of electrical enclosures, devices or wiring methods on a docking facility shall be required to comply with the provisions of this code when modification, replacement or repair of an electrical enclosure, device or wiring method is necessary on a docking facility and installation date exceeds like this. Devices or wiring methods is necessary on a docking facility and the installation date exceeds 10 years. The entire circuit shall be replaced with new electrical enclosures, devices, and wiring methods. The entire circuit shall comply with the following conditions. The marine is under continuous maintenance. An inspection is conducted of the entire circuit. All identified concerns during inspection are documented by a qualified person. Remediation is conducted on all identified concerns. Informational note 303 points us to the, uh, the requirements in 303. So what he's saying here that any modification, replacement or repair of electrical enclosures, devices, or wiring devices on a docking facility shall be required to comply with the provisions of this code. When modification, replacement, or repair, you need to, re if it exceeds 10 years, you're going to start doing some replacement and remediation. This is significant of a change, in my opinion. And look at the images. This is his justification. Look, he says that that we basically and I've heard him talk about this before his message is look we expect a lot of people just expect the electrical infrastructure to live forever but that's not the case so um so what he's saying here and, and I, I don't know if I you, you you'll have this document you can always pause this video and read this but I would suggest to do that I, I haven't read it in, in in its detail but I have lived this with Donnie and I've heard him preach the good news um and of this issue and he will always do this he will sh i i was with him on some of these pictures look at that i got that same photo uh that i took with my camera look at the uh the 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 underneath of some of this equipment and the rust this this these you can't make this up right you, you i can't i can't make this stuff up that's an actual installation this is what this is what happens over 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 a significant number of years Look at the the condition of this uh, of this panel board the the dead front. I mean, this uh, this uh, um, um, seal is not is not good anymore. Uh, look at this. I mean, th look at look at that. That that's just insane. Um, you know, so he's looking at this, saying the problem that we have. Now here's the here's the crux of the problem. The National Electrical Code technically does not address. You know reconditioning i mean doesn't address um maintenance and things like that we have 70b for that you've got nfpa 303 but nobody adopts 303 and 70b so the question remains how, how do we fix this issue um, how do i how do i go back and get somebody because remember fixing this what is it going to take you know to uh let me find another good one here look at this okay how, how, how do i fix that well, what I'm probably going to have to do is replace it. And what does it take to do that? Money. And if you look at some of these, I'm now this one here is probably a bad one to say that with, with that beautiful boat sitting right behind it. You know, there's probably some money in this, in this marina. But, um, but the, the issue is that, look at that, that's what's holding that thing closed. Uh, the issue is that, that it takes financial, oh, look at that. Look at that. I just noticed that. I, I thought he was taking a picture of the cloth, but no, look at that. They put their own thing on the outside. They drilled holes through it. So so the issue with a lot of this stuff is that there's no finance available. A lot of these, even a public marina, do they have money for this? No. 
They don't have money to go in and replace us. There, I took a, I got a picture of that one too. Um, uh, you got separation. Uh, look at these. You know that's going into the water. That 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 that's no longer uh, a good connection. You know the the integrity of the electrical infrastructure is is just not. not it's ungood uh, after a period of time. Look at look at the look at that. So so the question remains: How do you address this? And in my opinion, I don't think the code can. I really don't think so. Um, I think that I think that what we've done in the National Electrical Code will make a huge difference. And and we can't. I, I, I I'm I'm interested to see what Code Panel Seven says about Donnie's input, uh, public input, and how they're going to reject it because they're probably going to reject it. Uh, but how do you tell somebody that? Uh, well, you know, the code doesn't uh, doesn't apply ten years later. You can't hold a 10 year old to this uh, code version. We're going to be on a different code at 10 years from now. So I, it's a valid problem. It's, it is an issue. It's a financial issue for a lot of these marinas. And this is what persists. Uh, this is what happens. You know, uh, you have uh, covers that have been broken off. You have uh, installations where, you know, in this, it's, it, it, it's just not going to get repaired unless somebody pays to get that repaired and replaced, it's probably not going to be cheap. So he's raised a significant issue. He's saying that there's a life of this equipment just because of the environment. I can't argue with him. Uh, I'd love to know where your head's at. Look at this. This was probably hit by a boat. Look at that's broke right off at the base. Um, look at that. You know, Joe, Joe brings up... So, Joe, here's the thing. 70B, I agree, uh, but nobody adopts 70B. I mean, who enforces 70B? It's not adopted by a state, not adopt. I mean, you know who, who does enforce 70B? I believe there are some government agencies that enforce it. But, but this, is a, this, is a, this is a valid concern that I don't know what the right answer is, uh, honestly. I mean... This stuff, you ask, you, if you ask the questions, why are, why are kids dying in and around marinas? Uh, I mean, just go to, a, go to one of these marinas. Look at this. I mean, these guys, this is, this is a homemade, this, I, 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 there's, some, there's just no words to describe some of the stuff that we find in and around marinas. Uh, but the problem is fixing it and addressing it. Uh, these are all shock hazards ready, ready, ready to happen. Um, you know, and, and and so he provided a lot of pictures. Look, look how many pictures he provided. He's passionate, like I am about this, and that's the only public input here. So, uh, I, I would say that I'm not sure what the right answer to this is, but um, I don't know. It, it, it's a it's it's a um, it's a concern. It's a, now what I want to do. And you guys are going to laugh. I think we should have a bill. I think Congress should pass a bill. I really do. I think Congress should pass a bill to provide funding to update existing marinas. To fix the problems. There's not, the, the, the local marinas will go, if, if you went into some of these marinas and said you need to pay to rip all this stuff out and reinstall it, you'll put them out of business. And, and, I, and, and, and so I, I personally, I think that, uh, that I think we need a bill to address it. I think we need finances, and um, I'm going to try to pursue that. I really am, 100. percent If I can get my uh, my 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 uh, not my legal team, but my government affairs team engaged, that was one of the reasons why I reached out to Lucas Ritz's father, because I think uh, I think that we can make a difference. Uh, a couple more. I know we've gone away over time. Floating buildings, electrical equipment, and connections. So this is just adding some clarity. Um, it changes clear, adds clarity and aligns the existing with the 682. First level subdivisions A and B are combined and necessary changes made to accommodate. So um, no big earth shattering thing here. It's just a correlation. Again, by that crazy dude, Tom Dimitrovich. 555.30, uh, floating or fixed pier. So this was added by Mr. Holt. Uh, Mike's and get, you know, Mike's passionate about this too. And, um, and, and I, you know, God bless them. God bless anybody who's uh, as passionate about it and get engaged because that's what we need. 
Replacement of uh, electrical connection shall be located 12 inches above the deck of a floating or fixed pier. Hmm. What do you think about that? Fixed piers say all electrical connections shall be located at least 12 inches above the deck of a fixed pier, but shall not be located below the electric datum plane. And this is C is replacements. Replacement electrical connections shall be located at least 12 inches above the deck of a floating pier. And he added fixed, but in, but when we are dealing with a fixed pier, we're also dealing with the electric datum plane, which would vary because that that pier could be located underwater. But we really don't address it in replacements. I'm not sure if it's appropriate to say floating or fixed pier without addressing the datum plane. But it puts it on the table for the comment phase. I'll be interested to see what panel seven says about that one. Uh, electric connections shall be located at least uh, 12 inches above the deck of a floating pier. Conductor splices with... <laughs> that girl over there, the, that little round uh, box, that uh, A-L-E-X-A, -E she just answered. She says she doesn't know that. Scared the bejeebers out of me. Uh, within junction boxes, um, identified for wet locations... The problem could be printing error. However, the words within junction needs to be separated. So, all right. All right. So, um, again, interesting. Uh, let's move on. 31. Uh, electric uh, equipment e enclosures. They're removing the enclosure and they're saying electrical equipment. And this is talking about electric equipment installed on piers above and below deck level. Uh, raceways or luminaires are not addressed in this section and are not subject to the same hazard. So this is L. L left us. I think he said he had a run. I miss you, buddy. Uh, but we're talking about you. His ears are probably burning. Uh, so he's looking at and below deck levels. So I, I got to think about if if it's permitted to be installed below deck levels. Um, that would be worth some thinking. I, I haven't thought about it, but um, can I put electrical equipment below deck, below the deck or the pier? When I think I need to have them 12 inches above, I, I, I gotta, I'd, I'd have to look at that one. Um, but it could be that the, if it's listed for that application, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm, you know, there'd be something you guys can weigh in on. Uh, panel seven, I'm sure we'll dig into this. But just at first sight, that's the only thing that struck me a little odd is I'd have to look. Can I put anything in that location below that deck? But anyway, that's all for. Um, uh, 555.31. So let's close that one. We already did this one. I'm going to close that one. We already talked about 555.33. So that was, uh, remember, I accidentally skipped way ahead. Let's take a look at 34. Uh, chapter three that contains an insulated. Oh, we talked about this one too. This was a task group work. Wiring methods of chapter three that contain an insulated equipment grounding conductor shall be permitted where identified for use in wet locations. And all we're doing here is we are aligning with uh, other areas of the code. 555.34 was modified to allow better selection of the appropriate wiring method to install. Uh, public inputs adds the focus that the wiring methods of Chapter 3 must include an insulated equipment grounding conductor that is a requirement as part of these types of installations, okay? Uh, and it referenced temporary wiring, remove the... But here was the question. Why does it have to be insulated? Think about that. Why does the equipment grounding conductor have to be insulated in a marina that contains an insulated equipment grounding conductor? And this was the question that the task group had. And actually, we wanted uh, we were talking about like the research foundation coming up with what, what, what for what reason there was there were a few people on the panel that said I wanted they wanted to remove that. Uh, and, and we were correlating, so we weren't we didn't want to get as technical in that area. Um, and we said, well, if you if you really feel passionate about it, you know, put the public input in and say it doesn't have to be uh, an insulated equipment grounding conductor. But, um, you know, love to know your input on that. I, I don't have druthers in, in that. I don't have a dog in that fight. I don't I don't know. I, I'm, I'm 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 as inquisitive as probably others are. Uh, I just know what the words say. 
can't tell you why it has to be uh, an insulated, why it can't just be a bare copper conductor. So, so Bill, you're saying salt water, but this doesn't say salt water, right? And now I would understand if it said in certain applications, like we do in other areas, we'll say this has to be insulated or it has to be listed for, for um, uh, you know, certain locations for what are they, not hazardous, but uh, caustic environments and things like that. But I, I don't know. I mean, me, I'm, anyway, that's probably above my pay grade. Uh, okay, so 555.34, wiring methods for conditions uh, of use shall be permitted where identified in submersible. So, oh, who's this? Working in the field in Florida, Anthony Salino from Southern Shores Electric Company. Thank you. HJ's uh, deterioration due to intrusion of seawater by means of raceway separation has zero corrosion resistive properties and is not UL listed for submersible cause dangerous leakage issues around docking facilities, deterioration of continue connections, high impedance back to the source, not opening, thus causing pedestal fires. Ooh, wow, interesting. Uh, hmm. The equipment grounding conductors are not doing their job in relation to fault current due to the permitted Chapter 3 wiring methods. Poses a safety concern. So he wants to say wiring methods for conditions of use shall be permitted were identified for use in submersible locations. Interesting. 555.34A1. We were modifying 555.34A2 portable. Uh, all we said was wiring methods of Chapter 3 that contain an insulated equipment grounding conductor shall be permitted. And maybe that's dealing with the corrosion. Maybe that's part of the clarity uh, that, that that's why you have an insulated conductor because of what this gentleman's pointing out. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Rigid metal conduit, intermediate metal conduit. So Ryan Jackson, Ryan Jackson in the house. I don't see him out there. I see Mr. Froming out there. My friend, uh, we got Joe Bellantoni. We got Bill still hanging out. I don't know if Bill's still hanging in there. Salt water effects. Yeah. Bill's still hanging in there. So uh, thanks for keeping, for, for keeping the faith, brother. We got 11 people out there. All right. Keep us keep us going. And that's the last uh, public input. He was uh, adding, adding, adding intermediate. All right. We still got a few more. Uh, let's take a look at 555.35. Uh, ground fault protection of equipment and ground fault. Ooh, this is GFCIs and GFPE. So remember, this is what we, we came up with a tiered solution. And let me see who put this one in first. Um, this was Okay. So what we did here was we, we, we brought in, uh, let's just take a look at what we did. We said A is gone. Oh, I remember this now. And I'm not sure if I'm 100% on board with this one, but um, it sounded great at the time. Listed ground fault. So we separated to A, B, and C. Sources directly supplying dock facilities or wharfs. Feeders and branch circuits and then outlets for other than shore power, then boat hoist, and then leakage current measurement device. So we changed some things around. The key thing was we wanted to tier it and say, okay, source is directly supplying docking facilities. So it's any source. Could be a feeder, could be whatever. Listed GFPE rated not more than 100 milliamps. And here, remember, rated not more than uh, greater than 100 milliamps. Uh, shall not set to trip. So ratings and set to trips and the tripping levels could be different. How they're tested could be a little different. Uh, shall be provided for sources directly supplying all docking facilities or wharfs. Coordination with downstream GFP shall be permitted. Then B, feeders. We said anything that's listed, rated not more than, again, it has to be a listed GFPE, rated not more than 100 milliamps, shall be provided for feeders installed on docking facilities. Coordination with downstream GFPE shall be permitted at the feeder overcurrent protective device. And we talked about transformer secondary conductor permissions. And then we said branch circuits, uh, listed GFPE rated, this is shore power. Shore power, again, is defined as going to the boat, not more than 30 milliamps, shall be provided for receptacles installed in accordance with 555-33A. And then we said outlets for other than shore power, and that's up to 60 amps. Uh, and we correlated that. Remember, I believe it said, no, it said 60 uh, 210.8B went to 50, uh, and I think we uh, made a public input to increase the 50 to 60 
we did not want to remove re lower that from 60 to 50. And uh, we went to three phase 100 amps. And again, we went to uh, GFCI protection. So that's a class A device. And then we have our boat hoist. Excuse me, I was thirsty. All right, so and then we added all of the uh, justification for that. I think it was a good change. Um, we'll see what panel seven says about it. And we had two other inputs, 535.9 and 682.15. Uh, I don't know whose this one is. For other than floating buildings, ground fault protection for a docking facility shall be provided in accordance with 535.35. One through A3. Ooh, they're removing the leakage current measurement device. They say, get it out of there. Uh, Mike Holt. Ooh, doggy. Let's see what, what, what he's got up his crawl. If none of the shore power GFP devices are tripping, not over 30 milliamp, but the feeder supplying the shower power, shore power receptacle is tripping over 100 milliamp, then we have no hazard and no problem to solve. What will the leakage meter do? Identify the leakage of each boat? Okay. Now what do we do with that information since none are over 30 milliamps? Ah, all right. So, well, you know, everybody has the right to be wrong, even Mike Holt. <laughs> I, he, so he told me that <laughs> one day. I love it. But in any case, he said, Tom, you have every right to be wrong just like the other guy. Uh, but in any case, so here's the thing that this does this is a leakage device that you test a boat with and here's what they do if that boat exceeds the threshold the marina sends them to a non-powered dock that was the purpose of this and and this is a practice in place already at many marinas not many i can't use the word many because i don't know how many this is a practice that's in place on some marinas so, um, and this was, I believe, driven by some of the designers that were on the panel saying, hey, this is a practice that works because it takes one boat to take the entire marina down. And then what that does is that brings out the MacGyver in everybody that wants to go out and fix the problem on their own. So although I, you know, I love you, Mike, but I don't agree with you. I think it's a good addition. I don't make that product. Don't I don't think I plan to make that product. I think somebody probably does make that product, but I still think it's a good idea. Um, uh, this one doesn't have a change. Let's take a look. Oh, yeah, it does. Feeder conductors with GFPE. He removed branch circuits. The way the 2020 AC is written, every branch circuit that is not part of shore power outlet must have GFPE. This would include receptacles and lighting not related to shore power for a boat. GFPE. Well, he's not saying where because he's removing the GFPE requirements. Michael, you've got to help me on this one. You really didn't explain it to me. Hmm. Oh, well. Exception. Where the shore power equipment includes a leakage indicator and leakage alarm, a separate leakage test device shall not be required. Ooh. This is interesting. So if... My shore power equipment includes a leakage indicator and a leakage alarm so that I don't know if he if he means if I have if I build in that test plug for my boat, say, plug your boat in here first. Let, let's just say that I, I have a product, which, I, you know, I don't. But let's just say I do say I create a Van Ducky that you you can't turn energize the boat from the shore power until you plug it into this one and pass the test and then turn on the other receptacle so you it's interesting don ganeer good guy i like him i like don i don't know if you're online don but thank you brother good idea where more than three receptacles supply shore power to boats 
listed leakage current measurement device. So they, they list, okay, so this must be Tom Lichtenstein. I was going to say, it's got to be UL. Uh, listed leakage current measurement device for use in marina applications. So he's saying make it a listed device. All right, UL 1379. Look at that. There's a UL standard. That means somebody's making it. Um, so this is what you do. Uh, this is what you do. UL... 17, 1379. I'm a little dyslexic today. 1379. Well, oh, forget it. I don't know. I can't find it. Thought I'd be able to find it. All right, so that's the last one on there. So, so it gives you a flavor of what's going on in GFPE and ground fault, the ground fault requirements. 36, emergency electrical disconnect. Each marine, ah, oh, okay. So... I put this public input in a while ago. And you know what they say? Sometimes good ideas go down in flames, but then come back. Who put this one in? Look at this. <gasps> Thomas Dimitrovich. And this is the work of the task group. That's right. So so we, 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 we put it back on the table because there are a lot of people bringing it up. Each marina power outlet or enclosure that provides shore power to boats shall be provided with a listed... Now this... I'm not sure if I like this. Uh, it's saying every marina power outlet has to have an emergency disconnect. What I went, which I still say is a good idea, is if every pier had an emergency mushroom button. Now, the arguments against that was that in these marinas, you know, they argue with each other, they fight with each other, they, they'll, they'll, they'll be hitting that button whenever they want to. Um, but my argument was well, we have those mushroom buttons at every gas station. No one's hitting that button. Uh, that mushroom button is, is in a lot of locations. In my personal opinion, this puts it on the table for discussion. I'd love to see what the code panel says about this one. But I think that you should have a local mushroom on each pier that if something happens, you hit that button. Because remember, someone's in the water getting electrocuted. Where is the power coming from? It could be coming from this boat. It could be coming from that. You would have to hit the disconnects on all of these marina power outlet panels, the pedestals, to find the one that's causing the problem. And it could be on the other pier. If you hit one button, you take out the one pier or groups of, of, uh, of you know, maybe you take a pier and you separate it in half and you have one mushroom for that half and one mushroom for that half. Um, the arguments were, you know, the wiring would be atrocious. I, I don't know. But that's what that is. We only got a couple more, two more. Uh, 555.37, uh, type of equipment grounding conductor. The equipment grounding conductor shall be, oh, look at this. This Look at this. That's that Tom Dimitrovich guy again. So look at this. Um, what's, what's he got going on? Shall be, and it, this is, we're removing that insulated conductor. Look at that. Look at this. I, I, I completely forgot all about this one. Where a feeder supplies a remote panel board distribution, an insulated equipment grounding conductor shall extend from a grounding terminal to the service to the grounding terminal and bus bar of the remote panel. Uh, and we removed. So what is this? Let's take a look. Organized, organized for clarity to align with 682. Added cord and plug connected appliances to address the hazards associated with those that are not double insulated, added the exception to permit an uninsulated grounding conductor where the environmental conditions of the installation uh, permit, and then the language requiring a continuous outer finish that is either green or green with one yellow stripe is removed, realizing that 90.3 applies. And since this is not amending 250.119, that requirement would still be in place. So we got rid of redundant language. We didn't remove the requirement. We just said, look, 250, 119 still applies in marinas. We don't need to regurgitate things back here in the back of the book. So a chapter one through four uh, correlation, uh, noting that, hey, one through four still applies. We don't need to, because here's what happens. Sometimes if, if 250 and 119 changes and you don't pick it up over here, now you're out of sync. So always look back at 250. Last one. Am I over my 15 minutes? Bill? You still out there, buddy? Joe? Am I out? Joe, Steve? Am I over my 15 minutes? I think so. Uh, the main overcurrent protected device exception, a floating building in full compliance with 555.13 and moored at one 
at an ocean waterfront shall not be required to have. Oh, open a conversation. Fred Hartwell in salt water. I knew this. I didn't know Fred was going to put this in. Well, I'll tell you what. There are there is an IEEE paper that was published at the uh, last electrical safety workshop, and that talked about <laughs> just slightly, Joe. <laughs> I love it, Steve. Okay, I'm, you guys are hanging in there. Uh, so here's the thing: um, there was a a IEEE paper done at the electrical safety workshop that looked at the shock in uh, in salt water. Now I'll tell you, I was on a conference call yesterday. Uh, that dealt with, um, we were looking at, you know, what can we do for marinas from the Research Foundation perspective? And this discussion came up about saltwater. And you know what? And I've said this before, and I probably will never say it again. I said that I don't know anybody who has ever succumbed to electric shock drowning in saltwater. Every one of my examples that I've ever located was in fresh water. And I'll tell you what came out on that task group was the fact that the one individual said that he is well aware of five, I think it was five instances of electric shock drowning. And, and here's the problem. The litigation was settled out of court and it's all sealed. So we don't know what the problem was in any of those. So what it appears is in that saltwater world, I, nobody could give me the examples, but um, um, I think that um, and now, now I can honestly say, I don't know of any, but I know I've heard of at least five in saltwater. Now here's what the IEEE paper said that the shock hazard in salt water. Now, remember what? Let's talk about shock. Let's talk about uh, current flowing through the body. Why would current flow through my body? I mean, I'm submersed in water, swimming, and and I'm I'm I got my hands out here. I got my feet back there. You know, I've got this nice distance between my hands and my feet, my head and my feet. Why would current flow through my body and not through the water around me? Fresh water has a higher impedance because there's less impurities. So when I'm in fresh water, I am a lower impedance than the water. We know as electrical professionals that current will take all paths. So when I am swimming in the water and fresh water, which has lower numbers of impurities, the current, more current will flow through my body. Uh, when you're dealing with salt water, what I've, always read was that in salt water you have more impurities around you so less current will flow through your body but that doesn't mean that you still won't get enough current flowing through your body to put your heart into defib right four to six milliamps all that good stuff let go thresholds are important in water whatever now what this IEEE paper said was that the hazard zone because of all the impurities in salt water the hazard zone is bigger. Think about that. Fresh water, because of the impedance, my circle of influence, where all of my, my, where all my fault currents are going out, like in a globe, right? So if I said, um, I don't want to turn my coffee cup upside down, but let's say I have a globe like this because it, it's in a circle, the, and, and because of the impedance of fresh water, the moment I add all of these impurities from salt water, now my circle gets bigger because now my current can flow at a further distance. So their argument was right, wrong, or indifferent that current will flow further. So I might be, for example, if, if I'm in fresh water, I might be 10 yards away from the fault and not feel anything. And, and then as I get into nine yards and then eight yards closer, now all of a sudden I'm starting to feel tingling and I'm getting into that area of influence. If it's salt water, that 10 yards, I'm already in that zone. And I think it makes sense. And they did testing to prove that. But it still goes back to me to say, I don't know of anybody who's gotten killed 
and but you know again i was proven wrong i i remember one day i was doing a short circuit cut i was talking about fault currents and i told the audience i said you will always have higher fault currents coming from the utility. It will always be less than the generators. And I had this hand go up in the back and it was a person who said, um, uh, I would beg to differ because we do healthcare installations and sometimes we have more generation on site than the utility. So in any case, uh, I was wrong in that case. And I just uh, was corrected yesterday as a matter of fact. Uh, so salt water um, is much less because the resistance of salt water is much lower than the body resistance and thus not most current. You know what, Nihad, um, you're, you're right. I agree with you. And that's and, and that. But but here's the issue that I have, Nihad. Um, the other reason I think and I could be totally wrong, but I think there's other factors. Every salt water marina that i've been to the ones that i have been to which please don't take that as every saltwater marina every one that i've been to and i used to live at crystal i used to live in st petersburg florida for about three years and then crystal river uh because i worked on crystal river unit three which is being torn down um probably because i left and you know everything falls apart when i leave but in any case Every one that I've I've gone to because of the salt water, everybody takes care of things because of the 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 degradation. And it, it's a well known fact that salt water is much more corrosive. So there's a higher intensity of you got to clean this, you got to clean that, you got to clean this. And those salt water marinas that I've been to were impeccable. They were beautiful. Now contrast that with the lakes, uh, these public lakes in West West Virginia and Tennessee. Uh, in Michigan and all these other places that don't get as much love and tension. The boats and salt, everything is more expensive than salt water. I bought a pen reel and saltwater pen reel, enormously expensive. I bought a pen, uh, a pen rod uh, for salt water, much more expensive. The boats, much more expensive. Uh, you buy a, you buy a dinghy or a boat for, uh, for a, a pond or a, a lake in, in, in West Virginia or Pennsylvania or wherever it's at uh, outside of the ocean in, in, uh, things are a lot less expensive and and i think i think that um i think that there's a a level of of correlation between you know the investment that people make and all of the hardware associated with with salt water uh, they they are taking care of their equipment they're they're focused on it because of the fact that they're in a caustic saltwater environment and i think there's the mindset's different than you know uh than where cunningham uh, lost his life in west virginia uh, or where Lucas Ritz lost his life in, in Oregon. So I don't know. Um, but uh, but in any case, um, that was a point of discussion. Uh, and uh, we were not ready to go to say that there is no hazard in saltwater. I mean, it's proven uh, that there is a hazard. There are cases. Um, so And we have an IEEE paper that uh, helps you calculate and, and be aware of that. Oh, we do have one more, location submersion. We already talked about this one. Uh, 939 and that was when Al was on the phone we went and found it so we have a new lo a new definition all right and that my friends and family is the public inputs for marunas marinas babunas that's it we went through all the public inputs for marinas and we did that together in an hour and a half for a 15 minute tech talk I hope you enjoyed it I did. I had fun. That's I, I haven't gone through those those public inputs, uh, and I know a lot of well, a lot of them uh, was a part of my task group, um, and we had a great task group. It was a, it was a lot of fun, um, and um, so uh, anyway, uh, I appreciate all you guys. So let's take a look. Uh, uh, Bill, Bill Shell, FEMA has established datum planes. Uh, yes, Bill, you're right. Um, so. And, and when I talk to, when I talk to inspectors, they will reference the FEMA data, but those, those same, I think it was Dean Hunter that pointed out that they look at the, the water lines on the walls and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I think that's kind of risky. And I think uh, Bill, you pointed it out that, you know, that water, that, that it's going to be different for all these different locations, but FEMA does. And I know there's a website for that. Um, let's just double check that FEMA, FEMA data plane. I don't know if that's two words, datum, not data. It's not data. It's datum. What am I talking about? Vertical datum. 
Historically, the most common vertical datum used. Elevation values, old datum. Guidelines specs for flood hazard. Let's try this one. I don't know if this is it or not, but I'm worth. Uh, it's worth a try. FEMA's mapping program. Appendix B, guidance for converting the North American vertical datum plane of 1988. Vertical datums. National Geographic. February, February. So conversion software. Data collection. So there is. There's resources out there for establishing the datum plane. So, you know, to your point that, that you... you I think that maybe even in I, my suggestion was, whoa, 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 we do this. What are we doing in the code? We reference where is it? You guys are probably better at this than I am. Where in the code don't do do we reference other other uh, organizations to help us come up with uh, data points for something? I don't know if it's is it loads? Oh man, is it weather? What is it where we we actually? I think it's in two twenty. I'd be embarrassed if it's 220 because that's my code panel. Um, somewhere, we direct people to a document to help them in their calculation of something, and I cannot remember what it was. But I made the statement, and we didn't do it, but I made the statement, let's put the links and let's tell people where to go get the datum plane from. And we ran into a debate that, well, it's, it will be different by jurisdiction. But your different jurisdictions can amend the code. I don't have a problem with that. But if you put the placeholder in, then the jur different juris jurisdictions, uh, ASHRAE, yes, ASHRAE standards. So uh, thanks, Joe. Um, so, so my thought process was, let's put the pointers in the code to tell them where to go get that datum plane information. The good thing is we have precedence now in the public input phase, and we could put a public comment in to just give people that guidance. So that was good. That was good. Thanks for that input, Bill. Or, uh, yeah, it was Bill. Yep, yep, yep. Measurements established in federal floodplain UL could reference them. Absolutely. All right, I've uh, I've seen bone owners uh, peed off at the back of <laughs> into the waters, adding to the impurities. Yes, excellent, awesome. Well, we had a good uh, hour and a half uh, that for a fifteen minute tech talk for today. And here's what I'm going to do: every Thursday, every Thursday from here on in, God willing, and the creek don't rise, uh, I'm five o'clock. I'm going live, and we're gonna I'm, I'm gonna talk about something. I'm gonna try to put a schedule together. I want to hit some public inputs on 2023. Uh, Nihad El Sharif and I, uh, we were talking about doing GFPE. Uh, I'm talking to Larry Air about doing um, fire pumps. Uh, and I know I had requests for that. So I'm thinking if I can convince Larry to do it at five, and if I can convince Nihad to do it at five, that this is going, these are uh, some of the, uh, uh, some of our five o'clock Thursday uh, discussions. And I want to keep a cadence going so that all of you out there uh, will be um, able to uh, to just know that, hey, it's Thursday, it's five o'clock, Tom's going live. Uh, and all of these will be left online so that you can view these at any time. Uh, so it's there for you. And I'm going to create a folder. I'm going to I'm going to create a folder on NEC 2023 because I want to start making I want to get all of you engaged and involved. And I know, you know, L. Uh, L is out there. Teresi was out there. I mean, he has a bunch of public inputs and there was a lot of names on here. Joe Bellantoni, I saw public inputs from you uh, that are making public inputs. So you guys are engaged. I My goal is to try to get more people. Steve Froming, I know you're engaged. Other people are engaged. I want to get more people engaged with the development of the process of the National Electrical Code. I want to give you a forum so that you can give us your feedback and have your voice heard. And uh, and hopefully I can maybe I can deliver some of that to the code panels and maybe we can capture some of this. So thanks a lot, everybody. I've got to run to Bill. Take care. God bless. Stay safe. Stay healthy. And by all means, please stay healthy and uh, look forward to seeing you next Thursday at five o'clock. And hopefully it'll be shorter. <laughs> Hour and a half, 15 minute tech talk. All right, everybody. Take care. I'm going to start. I'm going to shut this uh, data down. And um, thanks for joining me. Don't forget to subscribe. Uh, and that's right, Nihad, three o'clock your time. Hit subscribe, hit that thumbs up for me. I appreciate it. It's welcomed. 
Um, God bless. Take care.